Well, hey, good morning. It's Mother's Day. And um, I decided on Mother's Day this year that um, I would dress up for the occasion. Of course, as uh, this Mother's Day comes on, whoops, wait a minute here. There's something that I realized that I needed to do. I need to change this so that now it's reading correctly. We've had some mishaps, if you've noticed, as we do this live streaming. And um, my wife was telling me just this morning of some of the mishaps that have happened during the uh, COVID situation. Mother's Day and a unique Mother's Day because of um, COVID-19 and where we're at right now. Well, we've been doing some live streaming, and as we're doing the live streaming, um, my wife was telling me that others have had some mishaps. We've had the light fall here. We've had the battery go down, so much so that I had to leave to try and keep it up. We've made some changes on that, so this morning, power looks good right now. I have heard that the others have had um, some live stream problems like the U.S. Supreme Court experiencing some, shall we say, plumbing sounds during the midst of a case or a news broadcaster not realizing all of the things that come across on the camera. Yep, we've had some definite mishaps. But this morning on Mother's Day, I hope that this doesn't prove to be a mishap. You know, on Mother's Day, whoops, we almost had one here. On Mother's Day, I talked about the fact that we would be in this format again, and we did, and we are here in this format. The intention is that in the future, we would be like to be able to do something where we can uh, maybe see each other. We've been kicking around some ideas of maybe doing a live stream and yet do it uh, so that we could be together maybe in the parking lot at the school. I'd like to enlist some of our high tech guys, or at least higher tech than I am, to come up with an idea so we could maybe have a parking lot where we could assemble in the parking lot, use the live stream, communicate that way, be able to interact this afternoon. My uh, older kids who are out of the house are going to be having a Zoom room party for mother, for Mother's Day. Our mom, or at least not my mom, their mom, Alita. So. It'd be great for you high-tech guys to come up with some things for us on this Mother's Day. Well, you know, as Mother's Day comes on, I do want to wish to you a uh, good Mother's Day, though we're under the COVID-19 uh, national emergency yet. Um, you know, for sure, mom needs to be thanked. Once a mom, always a mom. It's always there in the heart, no matter what. Once you're a mom, always a mom. Even my mom, who's at this point suffering from Alzheimer's, um, always a mom. I have delivered to her on some of these special day occasions flowers, and she would say to me, Tom, you don't need to do that, worried about what... Um, our situation was you don't need to bring me flowers and yet in this Alzheimer's uh, when I visited her and she couldn't really place me and then she said oh you're the one that always brings me flowers concerning trying to figure out who I was and as one of her children you know uh, what we do for them as mothers is a good thing. And I hope you have an opportunity to reflect on your mother and also to have an experience of appreciation for Mother's Day. 
the challenges of being a mom are great and the rewards, well, I hope you can have some memories of the rewards and enjoy some of them today on this Mother's Day. You know, as we come together on this Mother's Day special occasion, I'd like to ask you a question to get us thinking together, a question that often uh, comes up in special occasions. This past couple of weeks, I've been doing reviews and evaluations on staff members, and during those times, this question comes up, or during times of recognition, uh, question comes up. And the question is this, where do you want to be five years from now? For us, since this is May 10th, 2020, that would be 2025. Where do you want to be five years from now? And you know, the intent is to get you to think about the future and what you're doing now for down the road. And I've heard various response. That question has been asked to me in uh, special occasion situations, annual reviews, and I have asked that question. As a matter of fact, on this special occasion, I'm asking it on Mother's Day morning. Where do you want to be? And I've heard various responses. One occasion, somebody concerning their profession, they wanted to have established this certification and be in this place. Again, just recently, I heard someone say to me, well, in five years, I want to be seated in the sand with my feet in the water. They were talking about retirement and how that was coming, and that was what they were investing in, looking forward to five years from now. Well, they still have about three and a half years to go, so we'll see how that unfolds. Let me personalize this question a little bit more this morning by asking you specifically, where do you want your heart to be five years from now? As a mom, where do you want to be in your heart five years from now? And you know, I'm not talking to moms only this morning. I want to thank you for tuning in on Mother's Day, uh, for joining us on this live stream, but hopefully it's not just moms that we're talking to. Where do you want to be, Dad, or young people? Where do you want to be five years from now in your heart? Where do you want to be in your heart? And when I talk about the heart, I'm talking about the heart the way the Bible talks about it. Recently, this book I came across. As a matter of fact, I discovered it. It's not a well-known author. It's a book called What the Bible Says About Your Heart. And you know, this book by Gary Carpenter talks in there about what this heart thing is. And that's what I'm talking about when I ask you, where do you want to be in your heart five years from now? You know, the heart is the seat of the thought life. The heart is the center of where you devise and go after your purposes. It's the center of your affections and your desires. It's where your feelings occur, the emotions, and also the endeavors that you undertake. That's where the heart is. It's the place where you primarily focus and you feel and you think and you choose to act from. That's what I'm talking about. Where do you want to be there in the center of your focus five years from now and thus the things coming out of your life? Because as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Where do you want to be five years from now? You know, um, you may be thinking that well, that's really kind of a penetrating, pointed, maybe too probing of a question for a Mother's Day morning. But um, hmm, I don't really think so. I mean, uh, after all, on a special occasion, Jesus' mother 
on his birthday, as a matter of fact. She had some people show up here at the the Liverly stable, if you would. And as they were there, they were talking about this Jesus. Luke chapter 2, this newborn child. At Luke chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, they discussed what had been made known to them, these shepherds. And as they did, I want you to notice what the Bible says Mary did. And Mary treasured up all these things in her heart, pondering them. You see, it seems to be, Mary, of course, was the mother of Jesus physically on earth, and it seems to be that this is kind of a natural inclination for a mom to be centered or focused there in her heart. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just five years later that she was still in that same focus. It was 12 years later. Luke chapter 2 verses 43 through 51 tell us this occasion, a special occasion. It was the feast of Passover and Joseph Mary and Jesus, the family there, made a trip to Jerusalem, which was according to the traditions and customs of that day. And as they went to Jerusalem, went through the festivities, and on this special occasion event, Jesus, to them, was lost. They couldn't find him anywhere, and distressed they said they went searching for him to find him. Luke chapter 2, verse 43. And when they found him, he spoke to them some things that puzzled them concerning what he was doing there in the temple at Jerusalem, interacting with those well-known teachers of the day. And as the Bible tells us Jesus, after this, 12 years later, when he was 12 years old, 12 years later from the day the shepherds were there, he went home with them to Nazareth and was submissive to him. And the Bible tells us this. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Luke chapter 2 and verse 51. Still, the center of her focus, the center of her endeavor, her thought life, the center of it, pondering these things in her heart, treasuring them up. Well, the question is, where do you want to be five years from now in your heart? It's a good question for special occasions, and it's a question that we want to raise on this Mother's Day. Well, as we think about this, I want you to know that the Lord has given us some direction. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. As a matter of fact, the Lord tells us that we can give direction to our heart. In Matthew chapter 6, we look in on another one of these over-the-top promises of God. It's an over-the-top promise, and it's a promise that our Lord gave us in a series of messages, a series of messages that we understand from the Sermon on the Mount. This was what he was talking about when he said, change your mind, change your direction, because the kingdom of God is hand, at hand. The rule of God is present for you and me right now. So change your mind, change your direction. And he begins having this series, which is communicated clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, what this series contained. And this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're looking at the promises that are recorded here as a part of... There we go. It said for a moment there that we lost connection, but it looks like it's back live. One of those mishaps 
that has been happening in this live stream COVID time. Anyway, so what I was talking about is that here in Matthew chapter 6, our Lord in this message, which was part of a series of messages he had been delivered, this one called the Sermon or Delivering, and this one's called the Sermon on the Mount. Here, he points out to us how to direct our heart. You know, the heart is a huge matter before God. It is very, very big. Often, often, the Bible talks about God's interest in your heart. This book highlighted some of those, and I want to highlight some of them to you. As uh, I highlight these, let me share with you a note that Gary Carpenter said here. The Bible is nothing short of a history of God's effort to reclaim the hearts of men. Indeed, the kingdom of God, his rule, and it needs to be from the heart. It's a history of God's effort to reclaim the heart of men. In fact, the true greatness of God's heart is seen in his plan to restore the human heart to fellowship with him through the saving work of Jesus Christ. That is the predominant story of the Bible. God's saving work through Jesus Christ. And once we have Christ, then comes this direction of God to bring our heart where he wants us to be, even as Jesus tells us here in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, if you're with me in Luke or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 6, I would like you to look with me at verse number 21. We're going to jump right to this over-the-top promise of God. It says this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God has a big interest in the heart. Frequently, throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see God addressing the heart. First time he talks about it, he takes the thoughts of the intents of man's heart, that they're only evil continuously. As he looks on man's heart, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, this grieves God at his heart, that this was the condition of their heart. God, throughout the scripture, is very interested in the heart. When talking to Solomon, the wisest of all men, God looking at his heart said, but the heart of Solomon was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. God was hugely interested in his heart. Jesus, when he was here, spoke about why do you reason in your hearts like this? Because he knew the thoughts and the intents of the heart. On another occasion, in the book of Matthew, he talks to folks about, your hearts are far from me. Your worship, hmm, this value of God that you have, they're far from him. Indeed, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And create in me a clean heart, one that you have cleaned in our salvation or our redemption. Indeed, God has a huge interest in the heart. And in this promise, our Lord talks about the treasure trust of your heart. Your heart trusts in what you treasure. Your heart, like a metal detector being used on the beach. You've seen that? You've seen people walking around with the metal detectors, not just in the beach, sometimes in the parks. 
they're going around they have these headphones on and this little looks like a vacuum sweeper almost only they're not rubbing it on the ground they're holding it over and they're detecting treasure there metal I've seen them bend down and look through the sand or the grass to discover a metal metal detector your heart like a metal detector is like a magnet drawn to what you treasure the center of your attentions your emotions your purpose your endeavors the center of your thinking of your of your emotional life is on what you treasure so Jesus said so this morning we're going to take a look at the trust treasure or excuse me the treasure trust the treasure trust of your heart and we're going to look at it in three things here the treasure trust of your heart like Jesus talked about it here we're going to look at it this way we're going to look at making your deposit like the Lord tells us here and we're going to talk about your investing return is then this which he clearly points out to us finally we're going to look at <clears throat> enlightening <clears throat> your eyes <clears throat> excuse me enlightening your eyes to this treasure trust of your heart because the Lord gives us a picture and an illustration of this happening in a person's life so this is part of Jesus series where he was attempting to get us <clears throat> to change our minds to change our directions for a believer who has come to Christ already this is by no means an instruction given here by the Lord on how to enter into heaven how to get to go to heaven no in no way is Jesus talking about that at this point he's talking Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 to his disciples and he's giving them instruction about how to direct their hearts here that's what he's doing and as he's doing this he's not conveying how to get to heaven but what is a characteristic of a person who is on their way to heaven when Jesus was here he made it clear that going to paradise is not a matter of doing this some effort to change your heart no it was in the book of Luke chapter 23 at verse 43 where Jesus looked at a guy who had been a thief a criminal and this person well the interaction went like this they were taken to this place called the skull the Mount of Skull because it looked like that it looked like a skull this mount and Jesus was placed between two thieves the criminals there were bartering back and forth and they even said to Jesus reviling him you know get yourself down from here and take us with you and the other criminal looked at the one I suppose breathing very difficultly as crucifixion does do that it interferes with your respiration and he said to him don't you have any respect at all this man is innocent we're guilty yet he's here with us and then the man looked to Jesus and he said when you come into your kingdom 
remember me. And that expression of faith in who Christ was and was able to do and him trusting Christ, even at this point in his life when he could trust nothing else, him trusting in Christ, Jesus turned and said to that man as best he could there on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. That going to heaven was based on the person's faith in who Jesus Christ was and what he could do. The Apostle Paul speaking on this when talking about people being seated in the heavenlies, having gone to heaven. Luke chapter 2 verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. He says to us very clearly, for by grace, God's unearned, undeserved favor, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, not of what you're doing to get there, not of some action that you develop, not of some attitude you take in your heart, not, no. It's by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works that no one should boast. Nobody can brag about this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But once we come to Christ, because the heart is so big and important to God, we want to get our hearts to the place where God wants them to be. And that's what Jesus talks about here. You can direct your heart. And we're going to talk first of all what it takes. It takes making the right deposits. Making your deposits like this. If you're with me, look at Luke chapter 6 at verse 19. If you're with me here in Luke, verse 19 now. Where the Lord, in the Sermon on the Mount, says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and, moth, rather, and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Our Lord talks to us here about making deposits. Deposits. The deposits are treasure. What is treasure? Well, obviously, a lot of times money is a treasure. Treasure chest filled with gold and silver, gold doubloons, jewels, precious things. Indeed, a lot of times it is money, but it can well be stuff. John MacArthur talking on this says human human beings are natural are naturally things oriented. We are strongly inclined to be wrapped around seeking, acquiring, enjoying, and protecting material possessions. In prosperous cultures, like the Western culture, it's especially great and big thing. Indeed, sometimes people treasure those things. Lloyd Martin Jones, however, when he was talking on the Sermon of the Mount, said some very interesting things about this. He said that it's foolish to think that he's only addressing money here as treasure. Indeed, money is a treasure, but our Lord is concerned not so much about our possessions as with our attitudes towards our possessions. And it's a whole attitude about what you value. 
in this world. Our Lord is dealing here with people who get their main total satisfaction from things that belong to this world. It could be beyond money, your husband, your wife, your children. It doesn't have to be just money. It's what you treasure in this world that he's talking about here could be a position, a status, work. Could be that that you're investing in and investing in. Position, power, that car. What's your treasure? Augustine, a uh, person who had come to know Christ, had an influential ministry after coming to Christ, talked about where your pleasure is, there is your treasure. And where your treasure is, there is your heart. Are your pleasures that you're taking, the things that you're investing in, you're putting your time, your attention, the center of your thought life, all on things that are here in this life? Family, children, your bank account, your job, your status, your image. Those are the treasures. And Jesus' statement here is how not to make these deposits of your pleasures. Don't lay them up. Don't treasure them up. It's interesting, he uses the same here, same word here, a verb and a noun. Don't amass, treasure up treasures that are in this earth only. Because you can't keep that stuff. None of it. None of it. Just the way that life is made to function in this fallen world now. Moth destroy, rust destroys. Here's this beautiful piece of jewelry and it oxidizes. And we're thieves with their longing for what you have. Take it away from you. Sometimes stocks and bonds, sometimes the downturn of the economy, sometimes the way that we handle government spending takes it away from you. Can't hold on to it. Don't deposit there. Make your deposit, Jesus says, like this, verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Don't focus it on heaven, or excuse me, on the earth, in this world, in this life. Lay up your treasures, what you value and take pleasure in, in heaven. You won't lose it there. The point here is making your deposits, not in this world. Now, is the Lord saying here not to plan ahead? Obviously not, because the scriptures tell us very clearly that the mind of man plans his way and the Lord directs his steps. Indeed, we have to plan ahead. 
Is the Lord telling us here it's not wise to lay up for the future? Obviously not. The Lord gave counsel through Joseph in Egypt that they needed to take part and lay up for the future. As a matter of fact, we're to look at the ants who industriously do that and be wise according to the scriptures. So obviously not. But he's talking about this becoming the mainstay of your thought life, what you're endeavoring to do. Don't put it here, whether it's in bank account or whether it's in family and children. Don't lay it up all here. Invest in heaven. And I want to take you on to this next one then, because he says your return on investment is this the promise of god for where explanation for where your treasure is there your heart will be also that's a promise that god says your heart like a magnet attaches to what you treasure to what you're investing in you know this is such a vital truth God's promise is that this will happen and you can direct your heart this way. Sometimes relationships go bad. A person's heart gets disconnected from this. I have personally seen this where instructions being given to make investments in this person brings the heart back to where it has treasures, involvement. Husband and wife relationship goes bad. Definitely desire to preserve this before God like he intends. And there's instructions about investing yourself in conversation. I remember one uh, woman who was a farmer's wife and the relationship had gone bad and she was counseled to take actions to invest in his bank. So during harvest time, when he pulled up the combine, there to come in for lunch. She ran out and washed the windshield, provided him lunch, making an investment in his bank caused her heart like a magnet to be attracted back to this marriage. Breaking down for husband-wife relationship, the husband being instructed to think how to communicate with his wife things that she likes, things that you can go after to communicate with her. Taking the time, investing energy, his treasure in her bank and the heart, the heart like a metal detector, a magnet goes there. This is a promise of God, and it's a surefire principle for directing your heart. You can direct your heart. Now, you direct it in such a manner that it's laid up in heaven. How do you make investments in heaven? There's a, there's a saying, I'm sure you've heard it, it goes like this, only when life will soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Indeed, that's laying it up in heaven. Doing something for Christ, something that Christ that will last. And let me share with you this, what's done for Christ is done for other people. Moms, 
investing in your children's lives in such a way that you benefit them for heaven, for Christ. Not so concerned that this seemed to be a raw deal, but helping them manage a raw deal with an attitude that serves Christ. That's laying up in heaven. Dads and moms building relationships with each other by investing in the other person's bank. And you know, it's one of the best things that can be handed to children. This relationship, which lasts a lifetime. Investing in heaven. Investing in prayer efforts where they see you involved in this. You serving the Lord at sacrifice to yourself. You investing in heaven, they see this. You investing in your children for heaven. They profit from this. Jesus' principle about the treasure trust of your heart very, very helpful. To wrap this up, the Lord then gives us something to enlighten our eyes. As a matter of fact, he's going to deal with the eye here and how it sees. Enlightening your eye to the treasure trust of your heart. That this principle and promise actually functions. And the Lord does this by giving us first an illustration. You know, Jesus was the master teacher, and as our Lord, boy, did he pointedly bring this home to us. Notice with us in Luke, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 23. Jesus used the illustration of the eye, and he said the eye is the lamp or the illuminator of the body. And then he points this out. If your eye is healthy, if it is functioning correctly, it's all together, it's sound, some translations say, it's a healthy eye, then your whole body will be full of light. You know, you can, you can do this. If you take time right now just to close your eyes, put your hand over your eyes like this, and you notice that when the eye is not fully functioning, it's really dark. It is dark. But when it's there and it's open, there's adequate light, there's no injury, there's no illness to the eye, it's a healthy eye, well, then your whole body is just filled with light. It, it comes in. Then he goes on, continuing his illustration, verse 23, but if your eye is bad, he says here. In other words, it has a malfunction, a degeneration, an illness, an injury, so that it's not functioning. It's hurt. That's what the word actually means here, is bad. It's hurt. If your eye is hurt, your whole body will be full of darkness. It will be opaque to the point that it, you can't see through it. If then, Jesus said, because now he begins to draw the application. That wasn't too hard of an illustration to understand, was it? Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. So he draws the application here, which I hope is straightforward as well. 
for you. He says, if then the light that is in you. He's not talking about the external light here. He's talking about what is to enlighten you inside concerning your heart, concerning what it attaches to, what it detects and attaches to. It's what you treasure. It's what you take pleasure in and invest in that your heart goes there. If you're investing in other people, it brings them a Long. If you're investing in yourself and the self-interest of what you get to have, do, be, then, he says, if that light that is in you is dark, how great is that darkness? Jesus talks from the lesser to the greater in this illustration. The lesser is as much as a Hurt eye cannot have you see for the body to be having light throughout it if the eye is something that's inside and it is dark. It's a greater darkness. If we don't grasp that what you're investing in, what you're investing in, takes your heart there. If we don't grasp that, it's a great darkness. So Jesus concludes this with this application. He states this, no one can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other. He will be hmm, put off by the one. And he will make decisions to do what's best for the other. He will be devoted to one. And uh, distaste for the other in comparison. Not so much. His point you cannot serve God and mammon. Some other pleasure that you treasure in this life. Augustine said, where your pleasure is, there your treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart. And where your heart is, there your happiness. You can direct your heart. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Only when life soon be past, what's done for Christ will last. What's done for Christ is done for other people, not for what they get to do have be here, but for the betterment of them in eternity. You know, that's something I have to remember. Have to remember concerning my investments, my investments of my time, my emotions, my energy, to be directed by the Lord to invest in heaven, investing in other people for what is their eternal good. You see, things are to be used and people served, not the other way around. People used and things served as your treasure. This is a great truth for us. As a man thinks in his heart, as a mom thinks in her heart, as a man thinks in his heart, as a mom thinks in her heart, so is she. So is he. Proverbs 23, 
7. Direct your heart. You can. You can direct your heart. And it comes by this. Intentionally investing in heaven. With other people. Intentionally doing what's best for them in heaven. It's a great truth. A great thing for Mother's Day. Where do you want your heart to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Why, my goodness, by then, 100 years from now, 100 years from now, I would say near everyone who hears this this morning won't be on earth can't keep the stuff here. Stuff here, yeah, it can, it can captivate you, but you can direct it. You can direct your heart to heaven by investing the stuff here in other people for heaven. A great truth for Mother's Day. Well, as we wrap up this morning, I want to remind you that we are connecting, connecting not only to God and other people. We surely want to do that. We'd like to get some plans maybe to get together with our vehicles and do a live stream in a parking lot, asking some of our more technology-inclined guys to be working with me on that, thinking about it, communicate with me. We'd like to see that happen. It'd be so good to see each other, even if we're separated by cars during this COVID time. So, we'd like to do that. Actually going to be working towards that end next week. So keep your ears up for what's going to take place soon. Be great to look at you through the windshield and wave and even be able to chat or to FaceTime. That'd be good. Love to stay connected like that. So we're looking to that end here soon. I hope to get that in place. We'll be notifying you. Also, we're connecting not only with our own folks here in those manners, but also by prayer for other people, investing in heaven. This time, we want to pray for the 19th country where it's most difficult to live for the Lord. It's Laos. Might be good for you to Google Laos. It is a uh, nation that is under the grip of communism. And its religious situation causes persecution to rise for believers. Laos, keep the believers there in prayer and their testimony of investing in heaven. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you for this over-the-top promise of the Lord that we can direct our hearts, and it's very simply a directing by what we're investing in, where we're laying up, treasuring up our treasures. If it's in heaven by the investment in other people, Lord, help us be thoughtful and creative on that. As we go through this week, we sure have opportunities. We have opportunities to talk with believers about their hearts and how they're being directed, and even unbelievers and what their hearts are invested in now. Father, pray as we think about that with our own children, both those who are grown and we still have the opportunity to interact with because Lord, once a mom, always a mom. So we pray that way concerning this. And Father, also, we pray for the folks who are in Laos who have trusted you with their lives, have heaven guaranteed, and the opportunities for them to minister. Lord, help us to be aware of them, even as we minister in our own environment, in our own world, where we have a global crisis going on, that we would be with you in what you're doing. And Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Well, Church of God, 
Heartland believers, stay connected. It's one of our distinctive commitments. As a matter of fact, it's a commitment of a disciple of Jesus Christ, connecting to God and to others. It's what we're about. And then, as a believer, changing, like we spoke about right here, changing into Christ-likeness. He talked about invested in heaven. He was surely invested there from the beginning to the end, always doing those things that were right in line, well-pleasing to the Lord. So changing. And finally this, carrying on Christ's work of service. The three C's, connecting to God and others, changing into Christ-likeness, that's an ongoing process, and this, carrying on Christ's work of service, investing in heaven. Have a very enjoyable Mother's Day. Take care.